basic epidemiology, clinical aspects. Uh, how do you approach the diagnosis to ankle vasculitis, which is a, it's a, it can be quite challenging sometimes. Uh, the, the, the diagnostic approach is sometimes not very obvious, and it can be sometimes quite complex. Um, and finally, highlights of therapy, how do we treat, why do we treat the way we treat, and what are the basic concepts of, 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 of management. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this is the, uh, the most uh, recent uh, version of the nomenclature of vasculitis in general. And, and you might be uh, familiar with some of these concepts um, <clears throat> of vasculitis being classified based on, on blood vessel size. Uh, there are uh, large vessel vasculitis that mainly include Takayasus and Giants arthritis. Uh, there are medium vessel vasculitis, which is uh, the, the, uh, the paradigm of medium vessel vasculitis is polyarthritis nodosa. We don't see a whole lot of Kawasaki's or almost none, no Kawasaki's in our adult practices, but uh, certainly pediatricians so we see quite often. And among the, among the uh, small vessel vasculitis, there are the, uh, the ones that are less common, the, the immune complex mediated the small vessel vasculitis that include cryoglobulinemia, IgA, and those that come along with, with uh, low complement deposition, the urticarial vasculitis. And finally, what we're going to gonna talk about this, this session, mostly uh, the ANCA associated with small vessel vasculitis. Um, <clears throat> so these are, uh, by definition, vasculitis of small vessels which have some level of, of association with the presence of ANCA antibodies, uh, more or less. And we'll talk about that. Uh, but that's what grouped them together, uh, their uh, association with ANCA. There are notable differences among them. And sometimes the association with ANCA is quite loose, but nevertheless, uh, the, the, for pr purposes of classification and, and, uh, and approach to the diagnosis and treatment, this has been somewhat useful to, to group them together. Uh, <clears throat> so um, what is more or less what the definition or the, or the, uh, or the concept of, of, these, of these conditions? So the first one, uh, granulomatosis with polyangitis, uh, we call it now GPA. It used to be called Wegener's granulomatosis. And the reason the name changed, you may have heard about it. Uh, well, uh, it's, it's complex too. Uh, uh, Dr. Wegener apparently had some associations with uh, the Nazi regime. Uh, and, uh, and, but also, it's not only that, it's also that uh, in general, there is a move to move away from um, from eponyms. And uh, uh, so I'll present to you another vasculitis that has changed names. Uh, 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 and it's also quite an interesting story. Uh, so about GPA Wegener's, the, the definition, this is a small, a preferentially small vessel vasculitis, which has some distinct uh, histopathological and clinical features. But in the histopathology, it's a granulomatous vasculitis with granulomatous inflammation and, of course, vascu necrotizing vasculitis of small vessels. And you can see here granulomas. You can see here this necrotizing feature. This is called geographical necrosis. You can see this kind of almost digit-like pattern of, of necrosis, quite characteristic of Werner's. And uh, you can see palisade and granulomas. And you can see this blood vessel that is uh, severely inflamed, vasculitic. Um, so this is what, what when you biopsy these, these patients, defines GPA. The, the, the small vessel involvement, preferentially, with granulomas, ne necrosis, and vasculitis. So this is what, what brings together the concept of this condition. Uh, MPA, microscopic polyangitis, has a very interesting story. So uh, this condition was uh, basically grouped together with polyarthritis nodosa until the 1990s. And uh, it wasn't brought into the family of the ANCA vasculitis until, until really the 1990s, because it, serves, it, it certainly shares some features with PAN. It used to be called microscopic PAN, actually. And, uh, in, and well, later on it was recognized it, when ANCA testing got developed, uh, that, that came in the late 19, in the 1980s and, and early 1990s, it was recognized that this subset of microscopy PN actually had a strong association with ANCA. 
and share se several features with the other Anca vasculitis that at that time was Wegener's, and it was brought into the Anca vasculitis family. So this is another small vessel necrotizing vasculitis, but it lacks the granulomatous component of, of, of GPA. So you can think about it as a, as an, a, as a certainly a, a non-granulomatous small vessel necrotizing vasculitis associated with ANCA. And finally, the third one is uh, eosinophilic GPA, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, uh, formerly known, and uh, still known to some degree, as Church strauss uh, syndrome or disease. Now, uh, Church and Strauss were in Nazis. Uh, they were uh, actually uh, a very, uh, uh, a very accomplished pathologists, both. And, uh, but again, the, the name is changing because in general we are getting away from eponyms. Uh, so this one has many features of GPA. It has necrotizing vasculitis too. It has granulomas. Uh, but the, probably the, the, distinct, the distinct feature of this one is the, predomin the, the, the predominance of, of an eosinophilic inflammation as opposed to GPA, for example, or MPA. Much more pronounced eosinophilic inflammation. As you can see in these pictures, you know, eosinophilic stain usually is, is kind of uh, eosinophilic, bright red. You can see it uh, very prominently in this granuloma. Or in this blood vessel inflammation depicted in this picture, you can see clearly the predominance of eosinophilic inf uh, inflammation. Yes? Oh, the, the question is uh, how often actually granulomas are seen when one biopsies uh, different organs or, or cert certain number of patients. And uh, my, my answer was basically that it's highly dependent on which, which tissue you biopsy. For example, if you biopsy kidneys, it's very unlikely that you'll find granulomas. Uh, almost never you'll find granulomas, by the way. It's, it's very uncommon uh, to find, because kidney biopsies are so tiny, uh, and, and granulomas tend not to form in the glomerulus, it's very unlikely that you'll, you'll just find a vasculitic component, uh, glomerulonephritis, and, uh, and, uh, and that pro probably that's all you're gonna find. It's the common problem when we, when we get the question of which Anca vasculitis it is from the site of a kidney biopsy, you'll, you'll, ha you'll have no help of, on finding granulomas. If you biopsy long and you, ha and you have a, a relatively decent size uh, sample, uh, like for example, BATS biopsies, uh, you probably find granulomas much more often. Uh, lung biopsies are much, much more helpful from the point of view of, of of giving you a specific diagnosis because it's usually more tissue and usually much more granulomatous in the airways in general. The inflammation in the airways tends to have much more, uh, many more granulomas. So I would say uh, if your tissue is long, you have a good chance of finding granulomas when they are gonna be there. If your tissue is kidney, almost, almost never. Um, so um, some uh, basics of uh, epidemiology of these conditions. Uh, uh, the typical age of onset is uh, somewhere between the 50s and the, and the 60s, although it can continue to be found later in life, actually in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it can occur at any age, nevertheless. Uh, there are very well described uh, pediatric cases of almost all, all these diagnoses. Uh, our our uh, pediatric colleagues uh, see not uncommonly uh, GPA awareness, and we quite, uh, and we very often inherit these cases when they, when they um, become adults. Um, um, this, depending on which specific illness you are, you are uh, talking about, the, the frequencies vary in different parts of the world. Uh, <clears throat> the GPA form, the Wegener's phenotype with granulomas, is more common among uh, uh, Northern Europeans and is found more commonly in the Northern side of the United States. Um, uh, the, prob the incidence is described around 20 per million. So if you think about, uh, this is a little higher than what we see here in Birmingham, but just extrapolating those numbers, uh, if you think of, you know, Birmingham metro area is 1.5 million people, so you probably have like somewhere between 30 or so new cases of, of, uh, of uh, GPA, just the webinar form uh, each year. <coughs> Uh, the prevalence is, is it's an uncommon illness. If you think about it, these are uncommon diseases. They are rare diseases. Um, 130 per million for GPA in northern US to MPA 48 per million. Uh, 
this varies a little bit. Uh, MPA, the MPA form, less granulomatous, more vasculitic, tends to be more frequent uh, than, than GPA <clears throat> in general among, uh, among non-Caucasian populations. Uh, in Asia, Southern Europe, they tend to see m more MPA than GPA. Uh, the, the very, uh, very interesting uh, piece of information, for example, in China, uh, they, they almost never see the granulomatous Wegener's form. So they, 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 they basically see MPA, and even in the cases in which they have uh, some granulomatous features, uh, like, like uh, the, the antibody that they see almost always is MPO, they almost never see PR3, uh, which is something that is quite unique of, of, of the disease described in China. Uh, but the, but uh, in general, anca vasculitis, uh, especially the GPA Wegener's form, tends to be somewhat less common uh, among uh, United States minorities. Although we see it because we are a referral center, uh, we see uh, we we see so many cases from all around the state and and uh, and elsewhere that we certainly have very well described cases of of GPA Wegener's among our African American population. Uh, so I want to talk about the clinical presentation next. And uh, usually these, these patients present with at least a few weeks to a few months of, of illness. Uh, the, there is a subset of, of uh, anca vasculitis which is called limited illness. So they tend to involve basically the ear, nose, and throat area. Sometimes isolated involvement of the sinus mucosa. Sometimes even isolated involvement of the kidney or isolated involvement of the airways. And this could have l much less prominent systemic symptoms. So the patient could present only with you know, the sinus drainage or the, or the stridor and the difficulty breathing and, or, the, uh, or just uh, a abnormal, abnormal kidney function and, and urinary inflammation and have essentially no systemic manifestations. Uh, but uh, more, and those cases uh, quite often won't have a, a whole lot of prominent systemic features. But, but the rule, the general rule, is that, that most patients will present with some component of, of general uh, constitutional symptoms, including the ones presented in the slide, uh, fever, muscle pains, joint aches, fatigue, anorexia, like being a, like, like a general illness. Uh, so we'll, I'll walk you a little bit through each organ system and what do we see commonly in them. Uh, GPA webinars being the, the, the paradigm, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll talk about that. I'll try to emphasize the differences with MPA and, and, and EGPA, Chirk Strauss, and, uh, and again, go through each organ system. Uh, GPA or webinars uh, tends to present uh, quite often with cough, hemoptysis, shortness of breath. And uh, once, you, once you image these cases, uh, you see that, uh, that what you will see commonly is nodules or parenchymal uh, infiltrates or masses in a, a majority of cases. Uh, the distribution is, is anywhere in the lung, essentially. Uh, there is no specific preference for a portion of the lung. The nodules can go from very tiny, very small, to, to quite large, uh, certainly we've seen Ex very large masses in excess sometimes of those 10 centimeters that are in the slide uh, in, in patients with, with GPA. Uh, the larger, the, the, larger the, the nodule, uh, when it becomes almost a mass, the more commonly this nodule will cavitate and it will form a cavitary mass. Those cavitary mass are almost always uh, granulomatous. Uh, and so if you end up biopsying one of those, you're also finding a granuloma is quite high. Uh, you can have uh, hemorrhages or bleeding around, the, around these nodes of masses. Uh, and, uh, and you can imagine the differential diagnosis for these. You, know, that you find someone that comes with the diffuse parenchymal illness in the form of nodules or masses. The differential will be cancer, of course, especially if you have a large cavitary nodule. Uh, or it can be TB, or it can be uh, septic, septic infarcts, or some other kind of, of infection like nocardia if the patient is immune suppressed, or something like that. So the differential is wide when you still don't know what you're dealing with, but this is how uh, GPA or winners can present. And actually, we have a case in the VA right now that in which in which this is exactly the picture the patient is bringing, and, and certainly GPA awareness is in our differential right now. Um, so um, it, uh, the, the, sometimes the pulmonary infiltrates can coalesce and, and, con and form a diffuse consolidation. 
Uh, they can be, uh, that consolidation can, can come along with hemorrhages, infarcts, and uh, basically a pneumonic picture in the lung. So all that can be seen. And finally, our scary complication um, that, that uh, can happen uh, in, pa in patients with essentially all ankylosculitis, but certainly in GPA Wegener's, that is the formation of ground glass infiltrates associated with diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. 10% uh, you know, of cases with pulmonary involvement will evolve into this. Uh, they, they present, as you can see, diffuse ground glass opacities uh, that can coalesce into, into you know, hemorrhagic consolidation. Now, there are many things to say about DAH. Uh, it's scary, but it cannot be as obvious as you think. Of course, 70, 80% of these patients will present with hemoptysis, but not all of them. So, uh, you know, the one common mistake is to, is to uh, kind of downplay DAH or not think about it when the patient doesn't actively bring up hemoptysis. So you see this in the right clinical context, it's very appropriate to, to, to do a bronchoscopy and to do the workup for DAH because it could be, it, it could be that that's the problem. Um, you know, mistakes can be made, patient can be sometimes anticoagulated and, 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 and problems of that sort. Um, and so, um, um, moving on into some other, some other way in which a Wegener's or GPA can present uh, is airway disease. And uh, airway disease is quite challenging. Uh, it, it quite frustrating to treat also. Uh, how it presents, uh, depending on which portion of the airway is involved, uh, most commonly is subglottic in the trachea, but the, the, the presentation is basically strider and dyspnea, as you would expect from someone who has a, a partial occlusion of a large airway. Uh, it's usually a late manifestation of the disease, although sometimes it can be the only manifestation of the disease in, in certain cases. Uh, these patients, sometimes quite commonly can be ANCA negative. Uh, it's because the disease is so localized, sometimes they don't generate ANCA. And another manifestation of this is that uh, they can be quite hard to treat. Uh, the treatment is basically uh, concentrated on the interventions that our uh, ENT or pulmonary interventional colleagues can do through um, dilations, stents, injections of, uh, of, of chemotherapeutic or steroid agents, uh, they tend not to respond too well to our conventional immune suppressive agents. And, uh, and, and we commonly, of course, we treat these cases, but, but, uh, but I never have my expectations too high that they are gonna respond too well. And it's probably because um, once the airway tissue uh, supporting a structure is compromised and damaged, well, you cannot repair that. And, uh, and, and the, the airway becomes uh, very floppy and tends to collapse on its own, and, and that, that there is no way you can fix that uh, without stenting or some kind of intervention. Sometimes the, the more distal bronchi can be involved, so you can have a main bronchi or a subsegmental bronchus that can be involved, and then the collapse is more distal. Uh, again, very hard to treat. So uh, when you look at what MPA does and how it compares with, with, uh, with Wegener's uh, GPA, uh, usually MPA doesn't have nodules or much parenchymal disease. It's, it's more being less granulomatous and more vasculitic. It tends, to, it, it tends to present more in the form of capillaritis, a small vessel involvement in the lungs. So the way you see MPA present is, is usually through more, more through the DAH pattern of small blood vessel inflammation with bleeding uh, and much less or almost almost never, some, uh, very rarely with the, with the uh, nodules or cavities or masses that are more characteristic of GPAs because those are granulomatous features as opposed to vasculitic features. So um, <clears throat> DAH, inflammatory capillaritis, is the characteristic way uh, MPA presents. But the other way MPA presents and develops is through this. Uh, MPA is a is a commonly unrecognized, I would say, uh, a form of, uh, of uh, etiology of ILD, interstitial lung disease. When you think about ILD in association with our diseases, what comes to mind immediately? Scleroderma, polymyositis, RA. <clears throat> this is kind of not in our radar, but yes, um, MPA can do this. 
and uh, is, is described as commonly as, as seven to eight percent of cases of a of um, of cases of MPA can present with, with I, over ILD, and they can progress to fibrosis in, in the same way that other uh, ILD cases associated with connective tissue diseases do. And this seems to be quite independent of the vasculitis. So you can have no vasculitis elsewhere, and the fibrosis and the damage in the lung from, from, from MPA can, can continue. Certainly these patients have high mortality. When you think about uh, uh, EGPA or church strauss and how it kind of presents in unique ways compared to the other two, uh, well, asthma is the, 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 the characteristic feature of EGPA. Uh, asthma precedes usually uh, the, the, the overdevelopment of, of EGPA in a large proportion of cases. Uh, and it tends to precede also the vasculitic manifestations of it. So. Um, Classically, uh, EGPA will give you these, uh, similar to many of these eosinophilic diseases, you know, it, it, it's, it, uh, EGPA shares, shares, um, uh, shares some presenting features with several of these highly eosinophilic diseases like, um, like for example, allergic bronchopulmonary spurgillosis and similar conditions that they can give you these fleeting pulmonary infiltrates for a long time. And uh, they can, being a granulomatous disease, uh, it can also present with nodules. Something that is kind of unique about the GPA is that it's the only anca vasculitis that with some frequency can give you pleural effusions. So you won't see pleural effusions very commonly with GPA or with MPA, but you will see it like 50% of cases of EGPA involving the lung. Uh, and again, it's something that that it has in common with other eosinophilic diseases that also can bring you uh, pleural effusion quite often. And certainly DAH can be a presenting feature of, of uh, EGPA church trust. So uh, moving from the, from the uh, lung to the kidney, in the kidneys is much more easy for me because uh, there are not very many differentiating features among the three anca vasculitis in the kidney. Uh, there are a few, but not many. Uh, so they will present with diminished renal function. Uh, many things that I'm going to talk to you about are, uh, are uh, here are uh, general topics or general concepts that, are, that apply to most cases, but almost everything I'm going to talk to you about here has an exception. So they, they have proteinuria quite often, and the proteinuria is commonly non-nephrotic. So you, you shouldn't see like four grams of protein being spilled in, this, in these cases, or you know, large, large amounts of nephrotic proteinuria. Uh, if, if you see that, you, you think about lupus. You, know, you think about uh, something else, like a primary glomerulonephritis with an, a strong nephrotic component. ANCA would be much less common. That being said, uh, last year I've seen at least a couple of cases in the VA of patients with large with very well proven anca vasculitis with large amounts of protein in the urine. So everything has an exception, but the general rule is that the proteinuria should not be nephrotic or should, shouldn't be very large. Commonly, very commonly hematuria, uh, um, very commonly active urinary sediments with casts. Now, it's something that I mentioned time and again to everybody that wants to listen. You won't find casts ever unless you run it in fresh urine. So if you think about the process of getting a urinalysis, it goes more or less like this. Someone places an order, the patient is given a cup, the patient pees in the cup, the cup sits in the table for an hour until someone picks it up, then goes down, walks down to the lab, uh, then goes probably to a nurse station for some more time, then goes to the lab and sits in the lab for some more time, and probably is like, what, two, three hours before it's actually spun and, and done, Cast won't be there. So uh, if you are really interested in finding casts, someone needs to be proactive uh, the, and collect fresh urine and walk it down to the lab. It's actually an extremely simple process if you've ever done it. Uh, kidney fellows, uh, nephrology fellows are, this is what they do all the time. Same way as we looking at crystals, they look at urines. Uh, but it's actually quite, quite, uh, quite simple. If you walk a urine down to the lab and tell, you can ask at any, any tech in the lab to spin the urine for you, they always do it and they always help you look at the microscope with it. 
the only way to find casts, <laughs> no other way. And uh, these uh, very characteristically, uh, uh, the, well, the characteristic feature is that uh, they will have normal serum complements. And when you look at the kidney pathology, there will not be significant uh, 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 immune complex and, com uh, and complement deposition in the kidney sample. This is why this, this, uh, the pathology of these, uh, of these glomerulonephritic syndromes is called pulse immune. It's called pulse immune glomerulonephritis because there is not a whole lot of, of immune complex in the tissue uh, and, and, and the complements in the, in the serum are normal. Uh, because they are not being deposited in the kidney, as opposed to the other uh, common glomerulonephritis that we see that is lupus. So you see here, there's a picture of a crescentic, big crescent here, a crescentic glomerulonephritis. Uh, if this were lupus, you will do the immune fluorescence and they will be all kind of bright red, bright red, bright green, uh, depicting the, the, the complement and the immune complexes and complement deposited. In cases of ANCA, the deposition is quite quite minimal. So um, uh, trying to find some subtle difference between, between them, uh, uh, GPA or Wegener's tend to be, tends to be more uh, acute, more uh, active, more dramatic, less chronic. When you, think, when you talk to kidney pathologists, uh, they, they have these concepts of activity and chronicity in the, in the renal samples. And, uh, and and, uh, and, the, and GPA tends to be more active and less chronic, as opposed to MPA, which MPA is more kind of indolent, more chronic. Sometimes MPA is found much later because uh, the patient already has already established kidney damage more advanced because the presentation was more subtle, more chronic, less active. Uh, so uh, uh, GPA Wegener's tends to present more as this concept of rapidly progressive GN than MPA. So again, uh, uh, emphasizing the concept of being a more acute, more dramatic illness in the kidney quite often. Uh, with uh, eGPA, Chirk Strauss uh, is, a condition, is a disease that tends to involve the kidney probably less often. Uh, and almost always when it does, is in the cases that are ANCA positive. Now, the 50% of cases of eGPA, uh, Chirk Strauss are ANCA positive on average. And the ones that go to the kidney are usually those that are ANCA positive. Uh, almost never, although you, you, you can remember what I said about exceptions, uh, almost never is the cases of, of, that are ANCA negative. So um, ear, nose, and throat, this is a, uh, an important one that uh, can be sometimes overlooked too. Uh, GPA Wegener's uh, usually presents with these chronic rhinosinusitis with bloody discharge, epistaxis, um, face pain, crusting. You look inside these people's nose and you see this cobblestoning of the mucosa, sometimes with ulcers, with inflammation, with bleeding, uh, with uh, very thickened. Uh, and so uh, what's happening there is that the involvement of this uh, upper airway tissue is mostly granulomatous. And uh, so there are sinus granulomatous masses. Uh, that being said, uh, uh, biopsies of ear, nose, and uh, biopsies of sinus tissue and airway tissue tend to be uh, usually not very helpful, very non-diagnostic, because it's, uh, it's a tissue that where, for some reason, very rarely you can capture uh, characteristic features of the disease, like very well-formed granulomas. Um, very commonly, uh, these patients can have hearing loss. And hearing loss is, uh, is underappreciated in GPA uh, unless you ask, or sometimes even you ask and the patient, you know, this is, you, you think about this, you know. These patients are at least in their, at the very least in their 50s, quite common in their 60s or 70s. There is a lot of presbyacusis in this, in this population. No, they have hearing loss because they have hearing loss uh, normally. And, uh, and sometimes it's difficult for them to recognize ongoing hearing loss. And, uh, and unless you, you have a, an audiometric testing, sometimes you, this is very easy to miss. But at the very least, it needs to be asked about because patients tend to ignore this feature quite often. Uh, orbital granulomas, 
is uh, keratitis and scleritis are, is how this presents in the eye. Uh, we've seen orbital masses. We've seen, uh, you know, uh, certainly diplopia and granulomas form behind the eye. This is, again, granulomatous involvement, very hard to treat. Um, scleritis and keratitis is, uh, is another way this can present. Red eyes, painful eyes, these are the questions that we ask commonly when we question patients with possible uh, ankyovasculitis in the review systems uh, because they can present with scleritis and keratitis. Hyperplastic gingivitis is a, is, a, is, is a rare but quite characteristic feature of GPA. So patients can have like large hypertrophic bleeding gums um, the, the, and that, that's, uh, again, a feature of GPA that is uh, not usually seen, but quite characteristic. You can see it also with, say, sarcoidosis or even with some uh, uh, AM, AML type of leukemias, too. Um, and uh, we already talked about tracheal inflammation and stenosis. Um, uh, MPA tends not to go there. Again, it's less granulomatous, more vasculitic, so it tends not to involve very much the upper airways. Uh, and, uh, but Cherk Strauss CGPA can do that, uh, certainly can go to the nasal mucosa, and usually, like many other eosinophilic diseases, tends to cause polyps. Uh, so if you see a patient that has a picture of, a vasculitic picture with nasal polyps and eosinophilia, you know, probably the EGPA is, is in the, highly in the differential. And uh, that's a picture of a retroorbital mass. That is another way we can see this. Uh, retroorbital masses are, are, are now quite interesting because of the advent of IgG4 related disease that can also give you retroorbital masses. So when you see something like this, GPA Wegener is in your differential along probably with uh, IgG4 related disease. Uh, in, the, in the nervous system, peripheral neuropathy is, is very prominent. Uh, the classical description of the peripheral nerve involvement in most vasculitis, including ANCAS, is this mononeuritis multiplex. Uh, but just bear in mind that mononeuritis multiplex tends to be an early presentation of most vasculitic syndrome. So if, the, if, the, if you're seeing a patient that has had symptoms for several months, it will not be probably a mononeuritis multiplex. It will coalesce into a most symmetric polyneuropathy so at that stage. Uh, but it can be all of them. It can be asymmetric. It can be a radiculopathy. The most common mistake about this is that they are never found because the patient is never examined, because ne it, nobody asks. So, so uh, it, it, the case series describe uh, at the very least 50% of prevalence for vasculitic neuropathies in most of these ankyovasculitis. It's more common in the, the eosinophilic ones like uh, Cherk Strauss EGPA. Um, so you need to ask, you need to examine. Uh, I know this is a commonly overlooked and ignored part of the of the physical exam, but it's, it's, it's quite important. Patients usually won't bring up a whole lot, some subtle peripheral weakness or, or numbness, tingling, uh, discomfort in some certain areas. Now, uh, a peripheral neuropathies are pervasive. You know, it can happen in, in <laughs> they are highly prevalent. So sometimes telling apart what could be secondary to, to uh, vasculitis from what is idiopathic or nutritional, it can be hard. In the CNS, uh, it's, uh, the, uh, it's an interesting concept. Uh, Anca vasculitis uh, tend not to go to the parenchymal CNS quite uh, very often. Uh, the, the, so strokes or vasculitic involvement of the brain parenchyma is uncommon. Uh, now, what do they do? is uh, they tend to cause uh, sometimes granulomatous involvement, especially GPA, granulomatous involvement of the meninges in the form of pachymeningitis, headaches, confusions, cranial nerve involvement. So it's mostly the periphery. Uh, the, like, like you can see here, hypertrophic pachymeningitis. These cases are commonly ANCA negative. You biopsy them, there are granulomas in there. Uh, they, they respond well to immune suppression. They are, they are considered to be most consistent with GPA Wegener's. Again, everything has exceptions. Like, not too many months ago, we had a case of, of actual uh, vasculitic involvement of the brain in someone that was finally well proven to have GPA awareness, I think. So, uh, as I said, everything has a, an exception. 
uh, in the skin. Um, the skin is sometimes quite useful to differentiate vasculitic syndromes. Uh, uh, if you think about the, how these different syndromes present, uh, small vessels, when they involve the skin, they should give you involvement which is in the form of macules, papules, purpura. So when, they, when, when they coalesce a lot, it can become an ulcer sometimes, but that's when it's very severe. Uh, it, medium vessel vasculitis will give you involvement that is deeper in the, in the, in the vessels that are located in the, in the fat, and that will present as usually nodules. It can present as libido. Uh, it's those, if the, the involvement is severe, can ulcerate more often. Uh, so uh, anca vasculitis, like, like, like small vessel vasculitis that they are, they usually present as palpable purpura. When, they, when they, the involvement is very distal and very severe, it can present as digital ischemia. When the condition, uh, the uh, anca vasculitis are a small vessel predominant vasculitis, but sometimes can involve like medium sized vessels. Uh, and they could also give you subcutaneous nodules, that being said, or libido. So there is a, there is a, there is a, a range of vessel involvement, and you know, uh, ankle vasculitis are preferentially small vessel. Sometimes it can involve medium vessels. If you see that in the skin, you could see subcutaneous or libido, but the most characteristic presentation is palpable purpura or digital ischemia sometimes. Now, um, the, this, this, this type of skin involvement is less common for ANCA conditions than, for example, for cryogonemia or IgA-associated vasculitis or, or, or henoshonglin purpura. So if you see something like this, and you're thinking, you know, which vasculitis is this? Probably the, at the top will be something like HSP, cryogonemia, leukocytoclastic vasculitis caused by drugs or infections. ANCA probably will be lower. That being said, you can see it. But, uh, but just, just giving you the the, the breakdown of how frequent this, this, this could be. Other features in other organ systems, uh, involvement of the heart can happen. Uh, eosinophilic conditions like to go to the heart for some reason. Uh, the, the, it's not only EGPH or Strauss, uh, so idiopath, there is an actually a eosinophilic myocarditis with each, which is idiopathic. Uh, eosinophilic lymphomas tend to involve the heart quite commonly. So EGPA likes to go to the heart, but all of the other ankyovasculitis can also go to the heart less commonly, so, but it's more common for EGPA. Uh, so uh, they can be gastrointestinal involvement in the form you think about a small vessel vasculitis involving the, the, the gut, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and blood in the stool. I should have put that in there. Certainly they can give you, uh, they can give you uh, gastrointestinal bleeding, which is usually microscopic. Uh, salivary gland enlargement can be seen with GPA. Like many other granulomatous uh, uh, diseases, like sarcoid, for example, it can involve the, the salivary glands and can enlarge the salivary glands in a form that could be sometimes very similar to Sjogren's syndrome. So if you see salivary gland enlargement in a patient, bilateral usually, Sjogren's, sarcoid, GPA is your differential. Uh, can cause myositis because of diffuse vasculitic involvement in the muscle. And finally, breast masses, that is something that is unrecognized quite often. Uh, breast masses can happen because of GPA, GPA, and sarcoid. Usually those are the, our diseases that can give you breast masses. All right, so the, 